In December of 2019, Becca and I uh, moved into our second apartment in D.C. Our first apartment was a smaller one bedroom in a building. I don't know how many of you have lived in a building where you're sharing all these different amenities with people. So we were excited to find our own little townhome. It was really quirky, which is why we were able to afford it. Uh, I could go on and on about all the weird things about it, but we were excited to have our own space. And one thing about that space that we loved was it had a patio on the back porch, our own space to call our own, to have friends over and entertain guests. And so about a month into living in this apartment, we were on that back porch uh, watching football in the winter of 2020, and uh, it had rained the night before. And so as you enter into this kind of patio, there's these stairs, and at the bottom of the stairs, uh, the sewage had not, uh, sorry, the drain had not gone down. The water had kind of pooled uh, because of this bad, bad rain. And we kind of ignored it. Uh, it was draining really slowly, and it smelled a little bit, but, I mean, we live in D.C. You get used to some really weird smells around the city, around the apartment, and uh, one of our friends, though, as he was walking into our house, slipped and made the error of stepping into that puddle. And when he went to clean his shoe, the realization hit him that this was not just a puddle of mud. And then we all had the realization of what had happened. And over the next few weeks, as plumbers came to our house to investigate this issue, we learned that this wasn't just mud. Uh, the old, old pipes under our 100-year-old townhome had decayed, had even, uh, they believe, roots from trees had grown into these cracked, decayed pipes because when they were plunging the toilet, soil and tree roots were coming up into our house. And so this mixture of rainwater and soil and sewage had built up to the point that we had a plumbing disaster. Why do I mention this disgusting story? Well, in today's text, Jesus and the Pharisees are talking about this idea that on the outside, our place was, it was quirky, but it was great. Uh, it had that fresh coat of paint. You know, that first, that new apartment where they don't fix a lot of stuff, but they put that fresh coat of paint on. Looked good on the outside, but on the inside, in places that no one could see, something was terribly wrong. And the same is true for us. When Mark uh, begins this section that I read, he's summarizing where we are at in the gospel. Uh, he's showing that the people recognize Jesus. They're running around the region to bring their sick to him so that hopefully they can just touch him and be healed. Uh, Jesus has gone viral in Galilee. Everyone in Galilee knows who this man is. And naturally, with that increase of popularity, you've got more haters. So what we're going to see is the narrative slams its brakes, and we go from this summary to a story. And in the story, uh, the Pharisees are back on the scene. We saw them a few weeks ago, and they will continue to show up. Uh, but this time, they've brought backup. They have some scribes who came down from Jerusalem, and they're looking for a fight because they're sick of the things that Jesus is saying. He's going against the status quo that they had kind of set, and they want to fight. They want to come at him and try to undermine what he is doing. So it says, now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And Mark tips his cards a little bit here and shows that he's writing to Gentiles because you have this section with parentheses where he's explaining these traditions um, because the Bible, these scriptures, were not just meant for the Jewish audience. They're meant for the Gentiles. They're meant for all of us around the world. And so Mark is kind of showing here, uh, hey, this is what they're talking about. And he explains these traditions he says there are many other traditions they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels, and you've got to wash your dining couch. Never forget to wash your dining couch. And they ask Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? So they found their opening. Jesus' guys, they weren't following the tradition of the elders, and because of that, they're eating with defiled hands. So what does that mean? 
I've already shared a little bit about sewage. Are they just talking about germs? Uh, No, this is not a hygiene issue. The Pharisees aren't saying, hey, you don't want to hang out with Jesus. His guys smell terrible. They're filthy. They're disgusting. They're not washed. Uh, This is not about germs. What is it about? You see, that word defiled or unclean, impure, uh, it's used to mean common or ordinary, which to us today, we hear that and we're like, oh, so they're just normal guys. Uh, That's not the case because there's cultural implications within the text, uh, within Judaism. Israel was called to be holy, to be set apart unto God, different than the other nations. And so they had these laws, the Mosaic law and all the rituals and practices that were meant to set them apart. Circumcision, the Sabbath, purity laws, all of these things are meant to separate them, to purify them, to make them different than the Gentiles. And you have to think in their context, they're in uh, Roman occupied land. They're in their country, but it's occupied by Rome. They're surrounded by Gentiles. It wasn't just an important issue to the Pharisees, but to many Jews to be set apart, to be different. So defiled is the opposite of that. It's ordinary, it's common, it's impure, it's just like those dirty Gentiles. Purity meant closeness to God. It meant intimacy and nearness. We are his people, we can be in his presence, we can be close to him. Defilement was a moral stain that kept them distant from God. And if you look at the Old Testament and other writings, you can see that it literally kept them distant from God. Different cleanliness laws restricted your access in the temple. You could only go so far to get nearer to God's presence. So this is important to these people. And the question is, if Jesus is responsible for his disciples, did the Pharisees have a point? They're trying to discredit and undermine him. Were they wrong? They are Jewish, Jesus and his his guys. Do they have a point? No. Why? Because they're not disobeying the law, they're disobeying the tradition of the elders. What is that? Well, the Mosaic law, it does have strange rules and regulations. Those are the books that none of you are doing in your devotional time. Uh, It starts going off on things and you're just like, I don't know what is happening here, I need a little help. Uh, But this rule, this hand-washing rule, wasn't one of them. You see, between Moses' time Uh, and the law being developed, and Jesus, all of these traditions formed over the years that were passed down orally. Why? Uh, There's many different reasons, many commentaries believe, because the law was too vague. What God had decreed was not enough. They needed to know how to fulfill it better, how to do a better job of following their rules. Uh, I'm a rule follower, so I kind of resonate. Some of you are heathens, uh, and I will explain that to you. Uh, think of the Bill of Rights. It's this, you know, landmark document, not just in American history, but in human history for what it entails. Uh, It says something that we hear all the time, no matter where you are on the political spectrum. Freedom of speech. I have freedom of speech. And we say that, but what does it mean? That's a vague, even if you look at the Bill of Rights, it's a vague kind of statement of what those implications look like. Can I walk into any building in the world and say anything I want and have no repercussions? Can somebody run in here today and yell, fire, fire, and then run out, and then we're all panicking and getting out? They have repercussions. So that's what is happening here, is they have these bigger concepts and they're creating a little structure around it. Uh, There's even a term used Uh, They're putting a gate around the law. They're trying to protect the law to to build out these structures so that that it's easier for them to follow the rules. So they created these rules and best practices and religious traditions with the aim of protecting the law, guaranteeing that none of us will break it. So it starts with what's in the Old Testament. You know, the priests... They have these rules about washing themselves. They can't go into the temple if they're defiled, if they're unclean. So they have to wash themselves a certain way. And then they say, well, you know what? Why don't we all do that? Just to be safe, what if we all did what the priests are supposed to do? And not just before the temple. What if we all did it every time that we're going to pray? And maybe we'll do it every time that we eat, just to be safe. 
And maybe we'll do it here. And maybe we'll do it here. And those traditions build and build and build until they have these extensive laws. And groups like the Pharisees, they didn't just create those rules, but they would elevate their importance and hold them as authoritative as the law. And you see later on that some of these are codified after Jesus in books like the Mishnah, where even a quarter of it is just purity rules and laws that the Jewish people would follow. That is the tradition of the elders. Complex, passed down, man-made extensions of the law. Kind of unwritten social rules. You're not supposed to do that. We told you not to do that. And that's what they're accusing them of breaking. But the law alone would not condemn the disciples. The traditions of the elders did. And so you have Jesus respond. And what does he do? He doesn't even address the hand washing. It's not really a theological debate for him because he knows the Pharisees' intentions. He knows what they're trying to do here. Uh, if you remember the past few weeks, Pastor Ben talked about that idea that when Jesus saw the crowds, they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Uh, Jesus saw the state of religion and politics had led these people astray. And so he wasn't about to go easy on the Pharisees who were partially responsible for leading them astray. He's stern, he's sharp, he's even sarcastic in his rebuke. He said, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. He says, you are hypocrites. That's the Greek word for playing a part, an actor. It would be used in that sense of an actor. The outside doesn't match the inside. You have this veneer, this image of a good person, and it's covering up something bad, something selfish in you. Uh, recently, I watched a documentary about a school called Bishop Sycamore. Uh, I, some people have watched this. Uh, this was a prep high school, supposed to be playing high school football, uh, but it was fake. The team was just basically made up. This man, a couple men got together and they're like, you know what? We need to create one of those prep schools that's on ESPN all the time, that's really, really good at football, and hopefully we can send some of these kids to college. Uh, but the guy running it was a con man, essentially. And so this team that's made up of guys who some of them are too old to be in high school, uh, they're jumping from motel to motel and checks are bouncing and they're kind of sketchily passing along as a school until they get on ESPN and it's so embarrassing that people realize something's off, something's wrong. This isn't a real school. And it comes out later, all these different things. And in the documentary, the man who's kind of running the show uh, claims he's a good guy. He's just trying to help these kids get one last chance to go to college. He's not a con man. He's denying things that they had, they had the receipts for. They're like, no, you did this. We have evidence that you did this. But near the end, he made a stunning confession that I instantly had to write down. He said, why did I do it? To make my insecurity feel better. So he would claim he was helping these high school aged and even a little bit older kids. Hey, here's your one last chance to play college ball and to get out of your environment and get somewhere else. He would claim that and he maybe even believed it, I would say, to an extent. But he knew deep inside that at the root of everything, he did it so that he would feel good about himself and so that other people would look at him and say, you did something good. And that is the Pharisees, hypocrites. They had their bright and shiny exteriors and it was covering darkness. Jesus would call them else their whitewashed tombs, that they were whitewashed. They were clean on the outside, but they were dead on the inside. And Jesus tells this group, you know what you do? Your lips honor God, but your heart is far away. Your worship is vain. That means purposeless. It's self-oriented. It's, hey, watch me worship. Watch me pray. Do you see this? Do you see how holy I am? They're neglecting God's word for their traditions, and they're bringing others down with them. And we have all seen religion like this. We have seen people who use all of these exterior things to hide something inside. Mark intensifies it a bit and said, Jesus said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. 
So you're not just ignoring it, you're not just pushing it aside, but you've gotten to the point where you are rejecting God's commandments. Jesus, he lays the hammer down here, uh, but he doesn't just say it, he shows it. And that's where you get this next little bit of text that's a little hard to understand, that I want us to understand. It says, for Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles their father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. So what's he doing? He's showing God's authority, it says, for Moses said, and human authority, but you say. He's showing they have their priorities off. In Moses' law, it says, honor your parents. We've heard that before, the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's many different ways for us to honor our parents. In their culture, it would all be very, very vital and important as their parents get to their end of their life. Hey, you know how you honor them? You take care of them. You use your money to financially protect them and care for them. But these traditions give them a loophole. This idea of Corbin, it's vowing to God, deferred giving. Hey, this money is set aside for the temple, for the priest, uh, but here's the thing. I can still use it now. The temple will get it later, maybe after I'm gone, after I'm dead, but right now the money is still mine. I don't have to touch it. I can use it how I want, but I don't have to give it to my parents because I vowed it for God. It was a loophole not a faithful de development to the law, but a man-made tradition used to pervert God's word. And this is the slow creep of legalism. Traditions that are useful supplements. And I don't want anyone to hear me bashing tradition because tradition in itself is not inherently bad. If we didn't have traditions, every Sunday at church, we would make up a new way to do things. You create traditions that are good to help. But when you elevate those traditions and they're equal to God's word or they're above God's word and you say, this is what's right, this is the standard of how we do things and I'm inventing it myself, something is terribly wrong. So Jesus ends this by saying, this is just one of many things you do. He's barely scratching the surface. That all of your different standards and techniques and everything else they're missing the heart of God, to love God, to worship God, to pursue God, to, to want to be like God, to want to be in intimacy with God. You're missing the design of loving your neighbor. You're missing the, uh, the idea that your neighbor is created in God's image and you're supposed to love them and you're replacing that with being right by your standard at all cost. And you get to this point where you go, yikes. Can you believe those Pharisees? Pretty bad guys, pretty terrible. But the thing is that we do this too. We walk in those same footsteps. We excel at our traditions, at our techniques, our methods, our rituals, our spiritual practices, our spiritual disciplines. Again, all great things, all good things when used in their proper context. And we walk in these same footsteps not to glorify and pursue God, but to cover something inside of us. For instance, maybe you've known a person like this, that they have never missed a church Sunday in their life, but the second they stop smiling outside of church and get in the car with their family, they're mean and they're cold and they yell. Or you know that person who... They post all the time about spiritual things. They've got the verse in their Instagram bio. They're sharing the videos. Oh, this hit me. <laughs> but they get to work, and they're a different person. Again, they're cold. They're mean. They're, def they're uh, trashing other people they work with. At the holiday Christmas party, they're the drunkest person there. And you're like, what are these two things? How do they live together in the same place? Or maybe for you, you, you say, you know what? I gave to the church. I give a little bit of money. But you spend 10 times that on whatever vice or addiction it is that you have that you just can't give up. Our methods may not look like the Pharisee, but our hearts are the same. 
anything to make us look good to others and feel good with ourselves. Why? Why do we do that? Jesus is about to tell us. You see, the Pharisees disappear into the background. They're going to show up later. They're really important to this story. Uh, They don't really like how Jesus talked down their traditions here. Uh, But what Jesus wants to tell us is bigger than the tradition piece. He wants to show us that our traditions aren't the sickness. Our traditions are a symptom of the sickness. And so what he says next, he calls the people to him. And he says, hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. He leaves them to consider it. He runs off to a different house. And like always, the disciples, they don't really get it either. Uh, So they come to him, and they come to him in that house, and they, they ask him, what is going on? And he says, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said what comes out of a person is what defiles him. So Jesus explains this stuff, this exterior stuff, the objects that you're supposed to keep clean, the people you're not supposed to be near, those foods you're not supposed to eat, that doesn't make you clean. Or sorry, that doesn't make you unclean. The shrimp that was forbidden in the Old Testament. He's saying, that's not what makes you unclean. Disobeying the law made you unclean, but eating shrimp doesn't defile you. You can eat it. It might make you sick. You might expel it. That's what he says. We're we're not going to go too much deeper into that. It's been a gross enough Sunday. But it won't defile you. What will it do? It'll run right through you. You'll expel it, but it won't touch your heart. Jesus is telling us that defilement is not a puddle that you fall in. It's not a cold that you catch. It's not something that is done to you, which someone needs to hear today. It's not something that can be spread to you. It's inside you. One of our seminary professors uses the illustration of an apple. That if I show you this pristine, beautiful red apple, and you look at it and you say, you know what, that looks pretty good but you don't know that it could be rotting on the inside because apples rot that way from the inside out. And the same is true of us. Food doesn't make you unclean. Your heart does. Your heart is who you are. It's all those spiritual, intellectual processes, your will, your affections, your individuality. It's what makes you you. God is saying your heart is defiled. Your heart is impure. The separation that you feel from other people and from God, it's from the inside. It's not on the outside. And Jesus agrees with the Pharisees on one thing. He agrees that there's a problem. Uh, defilement. We call it sin. That peace in of us, that, that nature in us that uh, isolates us, that destroys our relationships, that eats away at us, that is sin. That is defilement. However, the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees is the Pharisees thought, we can manage this. We can control it. If we have the right checklist of things to do, we'll be good. If we create this achievable standard, we will know we are okay with God. And there's a Pharisee in all of us that thinks the exact same way. At least I'm not like that person. They are defiled. Why? Because they voted for that person, because they live this lifestyle, because they drink this much, because they do this or that, they're not at church enough, or they're at church too much, they're defiled. Something is sick and wrong with them. I am pure. Why? Because I can wash my hands. What are you washing your hands with today? I want us to think about that. I want us to take a moment to consider what are we washing our hands with? I will be clean. I will be pure. I will be good with God if I do this thing. If I go to a small group, if I do my devotional time, if I pray, if I serve at church, if I give at church, I'm just washing and washing and washing my hands. And it's not just a religious thing. 
if I agree with a certain ideology, if I post about certain issues, if I have a certain job, a certain amount of money that I make, I'm washing and washing my hands. I'm trying to cover something up. I want to be better than that person. I want to be better than that person. We do all these things over and over and again, and we're just washing and washing and washing, and we're scrubbing and scrubbing because we want to get the stain out. Like the Pharisees, we don't see how deep our problem is. We think that it's skin deep. We think it's controllable and manageable and hideable. That if we just keep it on the down low and nobody knows, everything will be fine. If we just suppress it with these different activities, we'll be fine. But we're defiled. Our hearts are sick. And I feel comfortable coming up and saying this today. Because I know more than any of you about washing my hands. Where are my church kids at? Interactive. Where are my church kids? I know there's a few of you here. I was the church kid of church kids. Paul says in uh, somewhere that just blanked my mind (laughs) that he is the Hebrew of Hebrews. He's bragging. He's saying, if anyone had anything to boast, I was the Hebrew of Hebrews. And he goes through all these lists of things. I was the church kid of church kids. I went to the VBSs. I went to the summer camps. I cried at the summer camps. I went to the all-nighters. I ate the pizza. I gave my life to Christ. I did it again. I apologized. I did it again. And then I did it again. I've been to all the church things. I've done all the church things. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I was good at it. I knew how to act. I knew all the lingo. You could just send me a quiz right now. Give me some 90s, early 2000s church culture quiz. I could pass the quiz right now. I knew how to act, and I loved it. Uh, Some of my best memories, some of my best friendships, mentorships came from that time in my life. I know that's not true of some people who have a rough relationship with the church, but I loved it. I was good at it. I was a nice little church kid that had it all together. But underneath, there was still something wrong with me. And Jesus isn't going to hold back. He's going to show us exactly what it is that our hearts are filled with. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. He's saying this is what's inside us. It starts with evil thoughts. That's where everything stems from. All these other actions and attitudes come out of our evil thoughts, of our sinful nature. So he gives us these actions, sexual immorality. It's a broad term for sexual practices outside of God's design. Theft, stealing and manipulating for your gain. Murder, violence, taking a life, adultery, anything sexual outside of the confines of a marriage with a spouse, whether it's with a screen or with a person. Coveting, unquenchable need for more, more, more. Wickedness, the perversion of good for evil purposes. And he shows us these attitudes that we have. Deceit, dishonesty to get your way. Sensuality, making light of sexual immorality. It's just a game to you. Envy, a dissatisfaction and desire to have what other people have. What you have will never be enough. Slander, you mock people. You insult people. You're mean. Pride, no one gets in your way. You get to live your life how you want to live it. Foolishness, spiritual and moral insensitivity, making light of heavy things. He covers all of the angles here to make it clear that there's no escaping what is inside of us. For me, underneath that rule-following church kid exterior was this, a distorted and sinful heart. I was wrestling with pride, insecurity, lust, and above all, this longing to be liked, that I would do anything to feel that way. So these church activities were a means to fill the longing, to cover up all of the sin that I was hiding deep inside my heart. It was a way to keep my hands clean. And I was a control freak. 
I don't know if any of you have felt like this or been like this, where you're just obsessed with controlling your image because you don't want people to see what is actually inside you. I would do anything to keep my sinfulness hidden in secret places. I was like Becca in my apartment. I had a fresh cone of paint on the outside, but something deep inside was broken, waiting to crack. And for me, like so many of us, uh, it was college when the pipes burst and everything came spilling out. Many of you have stories like this. You had the comfort and accountability of a church, and as soon as that was gone, it was compromise after compromise after compromise, anything to fill the longings within you. And I did. I chased anything and everything to make myself feel whole. And it was at the low point in my life that I came to the end of myself, and I realized what Jesus is showing, that I'm sick, and I can't fix me. We have sinful hearts that give birth to sinful thoughts and choose to make sinful actions. And I know some of us are here, because I did this, rationalizing. I mean, I'm not that bad. And I would challenge you, in this moment, it's a safe space to reflect, to look at your own heart. Maybe you don't commit adultery, but in your marriage, in your relationship with your spouse, some mixture of resentment, addiction to, to pornography, to your job, to a drink, is destroying that marriage in the same way that adultery would. For some of us, you'd say, well, I would never murder a person. But you harbor the type of resentment and bitterness and anger towards someone that they might as well be dead in your life. Or you say, I would never steal for someone, but the way that you've gamed the system in your job, in your workplace, your entire life has been pushing people down under you so that you could be number one. Jesus is showing us that even though we might try to cover it with good deeds and good excuses, there's something wrong. Romans says, none is righteous, no, not one. So we might say, these are just the times we live in. Look at all the good that I've done. Look at that person who's way worse than I am. It only happens when I'm drunk. Or we're going to get married eventually. I'll change when I'm older. All of the excuses and cover-ups that we put over ourselves to make ourselves feel like we are okay. And we can keep it hidden our whole life even under fear of consequences or perception but it's there. You need to know today, as heavy as this is, that you were made beautiful in the image of God. God made you with a distinct image of himself, and you have dignity because of that. But sin has carved a gap between us and God that we cannot fill on our own. Someone else has to do something about it. We see this in the world around us. Every day I get notifications living in D.C. of just terrible things that are happening that just break your heart. You see it wider than D.C., out in the whole world. But also we see it in us, the own brokenness and sinfulness in our own hearts. We are not okay. And then Mark drops it. Story's over. Cliffhanger. Jesus finished his speech. On to the next thing. Let's keep going. And that can be a heavy ending for us if we leave it there and don't consider what Mark wants us to consider. We say, I can't fix me, then what do I do? I come to church for the application. I don't come to feel bad about myself. I come to figure out how to game my life and follow the right rules to be number one. What am I supposed to do? Mark is forcing us to confront what Jesus said that your traditions and techniques can't save you and the problem is out of your hands. But he shows us the solution. And I want this to be a safe space for honesty because I think we feel that defilement. Not things done to you, but your own sinful thoughts and action, actions. We have that sinful nature. Paul says it in Romans 7. We do what we don't want to do and the things we want to do, we don't do. There's something wrong with all of us. We feel that distance. 
And I would say that that is a good thing. And that might sound a little strange. But let me encourage you, it's good to feel that. Like I said, our daughter, River, she's been sick a lot recently. Uh, Some respiratory issues. And so when she's breathing a certain way and when she has 103 degree fever and we take her to an ER or a doctor, we want them to tell us what's wrong. We want them to tell us how do we fix it. There's a Puritan writer that I was reading recently that Thomas Watson, he says, though our joy lies in the knowledge of our graces, there is some benefit in the knowledge of our corruptions. Why? Why is it good that we realize what's wrong with us? Because God will gracefully reveal our sinfulness, not to condemn us and shame us, and you do not need to leave here today feeling condemned and shamed. He will do it to make us aware of how much help we need. So what do we do? What can make us clean? Four verses earlier, Mark hid it in plain view. Verse 19, Jesus is explaining what goes into us doesn't matter, and Mark adds this commentary, thus he declared all foods clean. Remember, earlier Jesus isn't debating the law. He's dismantling their traditions. But here, something different happens. Jesus changes the law. In the Mosaic law, there were foods you weren't supposed to eat. And Jesus is saying, that is over. The dietary codes are out. How could he do that? What just happened? Is Jesus trampling on the law? Is he abolishing it? Is he just creating his own traditions, saying, hey, there are no more rules, live it up, do whatever you want? No, that's not what's happening, because it's clear in the Gospels, he values the law. He elevates it. He has a purpose for it. It shows us the condition of our heart. It shows us the need for an inner change. It shows us our need for a savior. So what is Jesus doing? In Matthew 5, 17, he tells us, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He has come to fulfill the law for us. He has come to accomplish what we could not in the law. So if the law can't save us, who can? The one who has the authority and the power to fulfill it, to rewrite it, to change it. He's saying, I can make all foods clean and I can make you clean as well. The late Pastor Tim Keller was formative to my spiritual growth in my life. Uh, And he preached a whole series on Mark. He wrote a book on Mark. I can't get his thoughts out of my head. I tried not to just preach his sermons, but I had to take uh, this one story from him. He talks about a seminary professor, a friend of his, who was trying to explain to people why the clean laws were important. Why did they have them in the first place? And in this, he's preaching through Zechariah 3. And in the Zechariah, the prophet is having a strange vision. And I'm going to paraphrase it for us because there's a lot of prophet stuff going on. I'm going to show you the important stuff. It says, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And he's accusing him because he's wearing filthy clothes. And an angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And the angel said to Joshua, listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant the branch. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. So Zechariah sees Joshua, the high priest at the time, and he's standing before the Lord. And Zechariah would have known exactly where he was and when he was. He was in the holiest of holies, the most sacred space within the temple. And he could only go there, the high priest, on one day of the year, the day of atonement. But something was terribly wrong. In the Old Testament, in the Jewish writings, we have a picture of how extensive the high priest's preparation would go. A week before the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go to the temple, leaving his family to avoid contact with any unclean things. For a week, he would prepare. Night at, the night before, he would stay up all night praying with the other priests, reading from the scriptures, anything to help purify his soul. 
the day would come and he would wash five times, head to toe, and he would do it in public, behind a screen, so that the people would see it happening and know that their advocate before God was pure. He would dress in perfect white linens, make a sacrifice for his own sins, and then bathe and change again, and make a sacrifice for the other priest's sins, and then bathe and change again. And then they would take these two goats, and on one goat, they would confess the sins of all the people. They called it the scapegoat. That's where we get that term. And they would send this goat out into the wilderness, and they would take this other goat, and they would sacrifice it. And after sacrificing it, the high priest would then take its blood and go alone into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was. And he would spread the blood of this goat on the mercy seat of the ark. And this was an act of covering our sins with blood, atoning for the sins of all the people with blood. And so you have Zechariah here witnessing the high priest in the Holy of Holies, and he's mortified. Why? The text tells us because Joshua, the high priest, was filthy. In the Hebrew, it says he was covered in excrement. And you have the devil, the accuser, standing right there saying, look, God, see how filthy they are. This is the best that they can do on their own. And Zechariah is witnessing this, and God is showing him a picture of what we look like before God in our natural state with our sinful natures. That all the purification, the washing, the washing, the washing, the washing, the rituals and routines didn't matter. The heart matters, and the heart is filthy. But God, amen, doesn't strike Joshua down. He doesn't condemn him. He doesn't punish him. He clothes him in fresh clothes and gives him a promise. That in a single day, I will remove the sin from the land through my servant, the branch. Not because of year after year of sacrifice until you get it right, but in a single day through my servant, the branch. And Jeremiah and Isaiah and Zechariah and all the other prophets don't know who that branch was, but we do. We know exactly who the promised branch was. The perfect high priest, the spotless lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And when he came to substitute himself, to sacrifice himself for us, he wasn't clothed in pure garments. He wasn't surrounded and supported in the weeks of preparation. The night before, those that surrounded him fell asleep while he anguished and prayed in the garden. He was stripped, he was mocked, he was beaten, he was spat on, and he hung on a cross where the defilement of us all was set upon his shoulders. Why? So that by his work on the cross, we can be clothed in his righteousness. We can stand before the Father, not defiled, not filthy, but clean. Why? Because he wants us to be clean? No, because he wants nearness. Because he wants intimacy with us again. We are still imperfect people, but he gives us that. He gives us that chance, and that chance is on the table today. Not because of our own doing, but because of that man. I don't know what you have brought in here today, what is weighing heavy and keeping you up at night, but I know that you can't fix yourself. I tried. I tried until he showed me I didn't have to try anymore. And since then, he has changed me and transformed me. And it doesn't mean I'm perfect, but I'm stepping to where he's going. I'm going where he's going, and he is transforming my heart. And he is taking those old temptations, those old desires, those old uh, things that I used to run to, those places I used to go, those attitudes I used to have, and he's changing them. So you can't fix yourself but here at our church, we can tell you about the one who can. The man who would command nature itself with a word, who could heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons with just a touch of his garments. The man who is not repulsed by our defilement, 
but draws near to us to offer us life. Do not strive for righteousness so hard that you completely miss the most righteous one. Paul says it this way, and then I'll end. When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The option on the table today as you sit and you wrestle with whatever is weighing heavy on your own heart, the option is to go to the cross. Bring that hurt, bring that pain, bring your doubts, bring that sense of defilement and distance and give it to him. Say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm imperfect, I'm broken, there's flaws inside of me that only you can fix, but I believe that you can and I trust that you will. God, change me from the inside out.